Well, we have a special speaker today who is a part of our group, uh, Phil Gaskell. He is an independent researcher. He earned a BA in history from Lawrence University, worked as a systems engineer for several IT firms, has been a science writer for Kramer Fish Sciences, a, scientist, a scientific and technical information specialist for Idaho National Laboratory, and is currently a technical writer for Global Transportation and Defense Company. <clears throat> Phil began pursuing his interest in the history of science in college and has been a student of history, philosophy, and methodology of science for nearly 35 years. He gave his first creation science presentation at the Second International Conference on Creationism in 1990 has published articles in both creation and secular peer-reviewed science journals, and speaks periodically on the subject of origins in Earth history. Let's welcome Phil Gaskell. Good morning. Thanks for having me back. I really enjoy coming back. I as you know, grew up in this area, and uh, I gotta say, I miss trees. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, so, today I'm gonna give a talk called The Source of Adaptive uh, Variation, Accumulating Evidence for the Engineered Optimization of Life. And this builds on the other two talks I've given, the last two talks I've given here at DSA, one in 2016 and one in 2021. And so, I wanna put up on the screen um, here the link that you can get to those two presentations uh, from. And I'll put this up at the end under the Q&A slide as well. But So I gave a talk in 2016 called Does Natural Selection Drive the Origin of Species? And in 2021, The Mechanism of Adaptation. And this talk is a follow-up on those talks and sort of extends it a little bit as well. I'm going to talk about some ongoing research that confirms uh, what was said in those talks uh, and, and applies it uh, to, to what we're actually observing in the real world right now. Um, and uh, because of that, for those of you that remember the 2021 talk and the 2016 talk, the first part of this talk is going to be a little bit of a review. So hopefully it, you won't get uh, too bored with that. I, I've thrown in some new information there as well, but I figured that I needed to go back and review it. It's been three years since I was here, and these concepts are a little bit uh, different than what you've heard. Uh, generally speaking, from pretty much anyone else. And so I want to make sure that I cover those again and uh, bring you back up to speed so that I can then apply that to the examples I'm going to give later in the talk. So I also wanted to point out a paper that was written back in 2018 uh, with Dr. Randy Galuza, who's the president of ICR uh, now. He wasn't at the time, but he is now. Uh, and uh, we presented that, or he actually presented it, uh, at the International Conference on Creationism in 2018. And there's a link to that talk as well. And again, I'll bring this up at the end. So if you want to, you know, take a snapshot of it, your cell phone or something, you can do that. So I'm going to start where I started uh, last time I was here, which is basically defining the terms that we're talking about. Because there's a lot of confusion over what evolution is, what adaptation is, what variation is. So I want to make sure that we're clear as we start the talk about what those words mean uh, so that you'll understand where we're going here. So the first thing we want to talk about is what is evolution? So evolution, uh, as defined by the dictionary, Merriam-Webster, I'm going to go to dictionary definitions for a lot of this stuff, uh, is as follows. It's descent with modification from pre-existing species. It's a cumulative inherited change in a population of organisms through time leading to the appearance of new forms, the process by which new species or populations of living things develop from pre-existing forms through successive generations. Now, that's a lot of terms to say basically the following. We're talking about common descent. So evolution requires divergence uh, via new forms. So in other words, one kind of thing, one kind of organism is turning into another kind of organism. Probably the easiest way to think about that is as the evolutionary tree. You've probably seen this in textbooks or online in various places, but the idea here is that from one or a few common ancestors, the life essentially branched out over time to what we have today, which is a number of different species, number of different kinds of animals um, and organisms. And on this tree, of course, you've got some dead ends. These are extinction events. Um, and these are the ones that made it all the way to the current uh, time. So that's the idea of evolution. Evolution requires change over time 
from one basic kind of organism to another. It's divergence uh, from the original forms to new forms. So what is adaptation? Because that's different. Adaptation is not evolution. So again, we'll go to the dictionary definition here. So it's adjustment to environmental conditions such as modification of an organism or its parts that makes it more fit for existence under the conditions of its environment. So in other words, it's fitting an organism to where it lives so that it's well suited for where it lives. It's a heritable physical or behavior trait. In other words, it can be passed on that serves a specific function and improves an organism's fitness or survival. That's adaptation. So adaptation then is essentially all about improved fitness. So it involves adjustment of existing forms. It doesn't mean new forms are created or develop or evolve. It just means that the current form adjusts to better fit its environment. That's adaptation. So what's variation? Because obviously the, talk, the, the title of the talk is a source of adaptive variation. So what's variation? Well, variation, again, dictionary definition, it's a divergence in the structural or functional characteristics of an organism from the species or population norm or average. So basically variation is a diversion or a, a divergence from the norm, from the average. So, um, you know, if something is known as a certain characteristic, if you get a change from that in one direction or another, that's variation. It's not necessarily adaptive. It's certainly not evolution. It's simply change from the norm or the average. That's what variation is. So again, we're talking about traits here. Trait just being the physical characteristic of an organism that it has. So, so variation basically changed traits. It exhibits deviation from the average form. So the important point here with these terms is that variation is not adaptation. Okay, so something can have variation, but it may or may not be adaptive. It may or may not help it better suit or fit its particular environmental niche. In addition to that, adaptation is not evolution. Simply because something is fit better to its environment does not mean it's changing from one basic kind of organism to another. It's two different things. And I've actually also heard that adaptation is microevolution, and it's not. I, I think... I suppose you could use that term to refer to it, but it's confusing, honestly, because when people hear, hear the word evolution, which just means change, by the way, that's all the word means, um, they confuse the word evolution with the theory of evolution, which is the idea of common divergence over time from an initial ancestor. Um, and, and so I would prefer to stay away from using the term microevolution to refer to adaptation because they're really not the same thing at all. Change is occurring, yes, but it's not what most people think of as evolution. It's simply adaptation. So now that we've cleared that up, let's talk a little bit about evolution. Because when you hear about adaptation, it's almost always in an evolutionary context. You'll go to a zoo or you'll go to an you know, animal discovery center or something, and they'll talk about all these adaptations that animals have. And what they mean is animals evolved over time to have these characteristics or traits. So obviously that's was popularized, it predates Darwin by actually centuries, but it was popularized by Darwin, Darwinian evolution, which is essentially variation plus natural selection. So I'll let Darwin himself explain it. So this is, comes from chapter four of The Origin of Species from Charles Darwin, and here's what he says. If useful variations do occur, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious or you know, unhelpful, harmful, would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable individual differences and variations and the destruction of those which are injurious I have called natural selection or the survival of the fittest. This is the famous passage which Darwin describes and defines what he means by natural selection, which is a key component to, the, to his theory of evolution. Um, natural selection pre-existed Darwin, of course. Actually, it was a creationist idea to begin with, but he took it and flipped it 180 degrees on its head and made it creative instead of conservative. Um, and this is, this is where he defined it. So, natural selection is a key component of our theory of evolution. And here's how it's defined by the dictionary now. So, the natural process that results in the survival and reproductive success of individuals or groups best adjusted to their environment and that leads to the perpetuation of genetic qualities best suited to that particular environment. So the idea is that natural selection is a force of nature which essentially molds organisms to best fit their environment. So the theory of natural selection, um, there's 
couple diagrammatic ways that you can explain it, um, a theory of evolution of natural selection. Here's, here's one that I put together, which you start with random variation. So there, again, variation just being divergence from the norm. So you've got sort of a norm in a population and it, there's individuals that randomly diverge from that. And then they're sorted by differential survival. The environment acts as a filter which sorts those random variations. So as an example, here's variation A, B, and C. And in this case, in this example, A and B are not advantageous, they don't survive, and C or B goes on, and that becomes the one that, that perpetuates. And so natural selection or differential survival has filtered out A and C, and B is what, what continues to exist. Another way to look at it, um, this is from Khan Academy and trying to explain the mechanisms of evolution. <clears throat> and you've probably seen this example. Oftentimes, predation is used as an example of natural selection. So the, here's the idea. You've got a rock here, and you've got these bleed, beetles on here, and you've got dark beetles and light beetles, and they all have genetics. They've got a couple of different what are called LLs or, or, or variants of a particular trait. They're here represented by a capital A or a lowercase a. Um, and so they, you know, they don't all have the same traits, but the ones that are white all have the lowercase, there are two lowercase a's here. And what happens is just saying, well, a bird comes along and because it can see the light colored beetles, it eats those. So those don't survive. And the dark colored ones do. And the dark colored ones have the genetics for dark and light, but mostly for dark. And so what happens is the next generation, you've got mostly dark beetles instead of a pretty even mix of the two. That's the idea of natural selection, an example of predation in this case. So, so Darwinian evolution is natural selection and variation. So the question is, what does Darwin have to say about variation? So here's what he says about variation in chapter one of The Origin of Species. He says, the laws governing inheritance are for the most part unknown. So he didn't know where variation came from. He says, no one can say why the same peculiarity in different individuals of the same species or in different species is sometimes inherited and sometimes not so. Why the child often reverts in certain characteristics to its grandfather or grandmother or more remote ancestor. Why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes or to one sex alone, more commonly but not exclusively to the like sex. <clears throat> so that's basically a word salad to say, I don't know. Um, so he didn't know. This is, Darwin, of course, predated genetics. Um, he had no idea where variation came from, but it's key to his theory. You have to have random variation and natural selection for Darwinism to work. So the current theory of evolution is not Darwinism. I don't know if you know that or not. It's something called neo-Darwinism, or it's popularly referred to as that, or more formally, that modern synthesis. And that is not variation of natural selection, but it's actually mutation. So how did we get there? Well, um, shortly after the Origin of Species was published, evolution became widely accepted. However, um, natural selection was not widely accepted as a driving force of evolution in the 1880s through the 1930s. In fact, um, evolution was in trouble about that time. Um, and the reason why is because, just as we discussed, the Darwinian theory of evolution lacked a source of variation. And it has to have variation plus natural selection, and it lacked a source of variation. So to solve that problem, in the 19, early 1900s, 1916 to 32 primarily, um, there are three geneticists, Fisher, Haldane, and Wright, that developed population genetics. And what they did is they argued that mutations are what increase the variability of a population. They're the source of variation. And then they used mathematical, statistical models of natural selection as a driving force using mutations as the source of variation to come up with what's now known as the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism. And so when you think of evolution today, the idea is mutation plus natural selection explains the diversity of life and ad adaptations that we see in organisms. So the question is, is mutation the source of, ad of adaptive variation? They argued that it was. This talk is about what the source is, so we're gonna look at this question. So, the first thing to, to ask here is, what is a mutation? So again, we're gonna go back to the dictionary. So a mutation is a significant and basic alteration. It's a relatively permanent change in hereditary material that involves either a change in chromosome structure or number, so we're getting into DNA now and genetics, or a change in the nucleotide sequence of a gene's codons. So the takeaway from here is 
Mutation simply means change in information in DNA. That's really what it means. So um, it's, not, it's not more complex than that. So what happened in the early 1900s with Fisher, Haldane, and Wright is they came up with this theory of neo-Darwinism in which they used mutations as a source of variation and the natural selection as a driving force, and they had expectations for how that would work. So here's an, a chart as an example. So on the left-hand side, this is the magnitude of change. So remember, mutation is a change. So it can be a small change, it can be a big change, it's just a change. So the idea is the magnitude of change, the negative would be deleterious or, or changes that were harmful or deleted information, and beneficial would be helpful changes, add information. And they expected um, that there would be pretty much an even distribution of deleterious or harmful and beneficial mutations. And the probability of the, uh, you know, how good the mutation is, um, is, is here as well. So those that are you know, probably a good mutation, a, a very helpful mutation, are going to be less common and be a larger change. So that's the way this graph works. Bad, good, high, low, right? So that's what they expected to find. But that's not what they observed. When they went out of nature, what they actually observed is this graph on the right. The only thing they could find were harmful mutations. That's it. This side's blank. And now, just to be clear, not to belabor the point too much, but in order for neo-Darwinism to be a valid functional theory, this has to be the case, right? Because you need to have essentially random variation from random mutations, and then natural selection has to sort those. Those that are bad, it eliminates. Those that are good, it keeps. So if you don't have any good mutations, you can't sort anything, and you're dead in the water. No change happens, right? So that's what it was by, like back in 1930s. <clears throat> so what do you think it looks like today? Almost 100 years later, have we found any beneficial mutations? Well, again, this is what it looked like in the 1930s, nothing. Here's what it looks like today. Now, it's probably kind of hard to see this, but actually there's a little tail on the graph right down there. And these are mutations which could be considered perhaps beneficial. Um, they are somewhat debatable. But let's just, for the sake of argument, grant that perhaps these are real beneficial mutations. You can see that there's not a lot of them, and that they are not, they're not frequent, and they're not high, and they're not great in magnitude, right? So this is a problem for the theory of, of uh, neo-Darwinism. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is something called genetic loading, and it relates directly to what we just talked about. So what is genetic loading? Well, the term was coined by J.C. Sanford. He was a geneticist and inventor of the gene gun, um, which is used in genetic engineering. And here's what he observed. He basically took the work of someone called Kimura from 1979, and, and Kimura showed that most mutations are nearly neutral. So in other words, they don't have much effect, but they're still deleterious. So they're still what you would call harmful mutations. But he said that even those are too small for natural selection to do anything with. So in other words, natural selection, remember, is based on the idea of differential survival or differential reproduction. So if, if the mutation is so small that it really makes no difference to the animal's survival or how many offspring the animal produces, it can't be selected by natural selection. It has no effect. And he argued that most mutations are nearly neutral and too small to have any effect for natural selection. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, in a graphic present, uh, presentation, this is what it would look like. This is the same graph as before with you know, some of the keys gone. But this is what was called by Kimura the no selection zone. So in other words, natural selection can't work on anything that's in this zone. So, of course, remember where the quote-unquote beneficial mutations are, right? They're right there in the zone, which means they can't be selected. So they don't do any good. So we don't have a mechanism for evolution now, right? We've got a problem. In fact, here's what genetic loading, though, is. You see this tail over here? These are harmful mutations. Those are the only ones getting selected. They're outside the no selection zone. So that's a problem. Um, because they're not selected away by natural selection, what happens? They rapidly accumulate in the genome. So instead of having beneficial mutations and being driven by natural selection to adapt and improve the organism, instead we have mutations rapidly accumulating that are harmful. And so because of that, the genome 
should rapidly break down. And that, of course, results in extinction. If you don't have a functioning genetic code, you can't reproduce, you go extinct. So Sanford actually called this term genetic entropy, coined that term in 2005, and he demonstrated this with the rapid extinction of H1N1, or bird flu, lineages, um, due to continuous accumulation of mutations, and he demonstrated that in 2012. Thankfully for us, those kind of organisms, viruses, repopulate, reproduce, regenerate much more quickly than most organisms do, including humans. So the sad news is we're going to extinction as well, we're just doing it more slowly. And of course, that's a problem. So the question here is, uh, those changes that are adaptive, because there are ad adaptations in organisms out there, right? You can go and see organisms that are very closely fit to their environment, so they have adaptive changes. And, and are, they, are those mutations? So we just learned that the vast majority of mutations are not selectable, and that no beneficial mutations are selectable. They're that little tiny tail with, well within the zone of no selection. Um, and that all those that are selectable, or potentially selectable, again, uh, graft, are harmful. They're maladaptive. So the one word we're missing in this discussion, though, that most people are thinking of, and I want to put it in there just to be clear, is what we're really talking about here are random mutations. So these are mistakes. These are not directed. These are not purposeful. These are just changes that happen in the genome randomly. They're errors, mistakes, just they happen for no reason in particular. So that's what we're talking about, and that's what is supposedly driving variation in evolution. Because remember, evolution has no directed, purposeful component to it at all. It's blind chance, right? And so in contrast to that, though, there's considerable evidence that there are mutations, and remember, mutation just means change, a change in genetic code, that are adaptive, and they're not random, but they're repeatable, they're highly regulated, and they're tightly controlled, and it's done so by the organisms themselves. So let me give you a quote about that. This is from a chapter called What is Mutation? And it's uh, from PLOS Genetics, and this is back from 2019. Here's what it says. The assumptions of purely chance mutations that occur constantly, gradually, and uniformly in genomes have underpinned biology for almost a century. But we argue that regulated mutagenesis mechanisms greatly increase the probability that the useful mutation will occur at the right time and possibly in the right places. Assumptions about the gradual, clock-like, and environmentally blind nature of mutation are ready for retirement. So, what I'm going to argue here from moving on in this presentation is that the adaptive mutations are not random mutations, and that's key. So if they're not random mutations, then, going back to this diagram, this diagram doesn't make any sense, because if you take the random part out of variation, then there's nothing left for natural selection to do, right? Natural selection takes a random variation, variation in any direction, and then selects those that are helpful and removes those that are harmful. But if the mutations aren't random, if they're targeted instead, then there's nothing for the environment to do as a filter. So differential survivor goes away, and we're left with just variation itself. And a lot of evolutionary biologists have recognized this, and it's a problem, to the point that I've got some just some examples of articles that have come out over the last 15 to 20 years um, where they recognize this problem. So we've got here, you know, Darwin retried an appeal to reason. What Darwin got wrong, Darwinian evolution in the light of genomics, the types, a persistent structuralist challenge to Darwinian pan-selectionism, dogma and doubt, does evolutionary theory need a rethink, and an expose of, of the evolution industry. And I, pulled a couple of quotes from this, from the meeting called the Altenberg 16, where 16 evolutionary biologists met together to discuss the state of affairs with the, the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution and the fact that it's in crisis. And here's a couple of interesting quotes from that. This is one from Antonio Lima de Feria. He says, Darwinism and the neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis last dusted off 70 years ago actually hinder discovery of the mechanism of evolution. If you have a theory without a mechanism, you have to get a theory in, in crisis. And then this one is even more illuminating from Jerry Fodor. He says, basically, I don't think anyone knows how evolution works. That's a problem for your theory, right? And the reason why they're saying this is because adaptive variation has a critical role here. 
But Darwin, even though he needed to know the source of adaptive variation, which is key, he didn't know it. He couldn't identify it. As a result, Darwinism actually failed. Most people don't think about that, but Darwinism as a theory failed. It was replaced by Neo-Darwinism. But the problem is that the modern synthesis misidentifies the source of adaptation, of adaptive variation as a random mutation. And as a result, Neo-Darwinism is in crisis. So the question I have is, if on the evolution side of the house, they have not correctly identified the source of adaptive variation and the theories have either failed or are in crisis, what about the creation side of the house? Does the current creation model correctly identify the source of adaptive variation? So to answer that question, we have to ask, what is the current creation model? And you guys should, hopefully, a lot of you are familiar with this. I don't know if you've thought about what the current creation model is, but there's a fancy name for it, heterozygous fractionation. So if you remember nothing else from my talk, remember heterozygous fractionation, because it's just kind of fun to say, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means pre-existing variation plus adaptive processes. So heterozygous just means having two different alleles for the same trait, for a particular trait. So as an example, if you have dogs, you've got short hair and long hair, for instance. You've got a, an allele or a genetic code, a gene that codes for long hair and one that codes for short hair. That, that's the same gene, essentially, that codes for hair length, but one is short and one is long. So that's a different allele. So that's it's variety. It's, uh, it's variation, right? And so heterozygous means having two different alleles for a particular traits. So, so you've got lots of variety built in there. And then fractionation just means separation. So the idea here is that considerable variation was created by God at creation in the terms of heterozygous, so a lot of different variation for different traits just put right into the cell, right into the organism to begin with, and then over time, that's subsequently been split up into different species over time. So it's kind of, you started with all the variation and you've taken pieces of it out and each piece eventually ends up being a different species as it works its way out over time. So pre-existing genetic diversity is variation, right? Because variation is just a deviation from the norm. But the question is, is it adaptive variation? Because you can have change from the norm, but if it's not adaptive, it doesn't help the organism fit to its niche, it's not adaptive, right? So I, I don't know if I should call this the dirty little secret, but if you think about the logic for it here, the current creation model relies on essentially exactly the same processes as evolution to select this variation and achieve adaptation. And I know that's kind of a I don't know if it's an inflammatory statement, but it's true. It's not, it's not in my words. Here's, here's uh, a quote from Replacing Darwin, the New Origin of Species by Nathaniel Jensen, who works for Answers in Genesis, AIG. Um, this is a quote from his book where he explains the model of heterozygous fractionation uh, comparing its evolution. Here's what he says. In contrast, under the model of pre-existing genetic diversity, again, heterozygous fractionation. I'm going to say that as many times as I can because it's just so much fun to say. So heterozygous fractionation. So pre-existing genetic diversity. The second element of the speciation process, that's the, the, the phase at which the selection event occurs. Okay, that's what he means by the second element. Can occur much more quickly. So his argument is that, that evolution takes a long time in natural selection because you've got to generate all these random variations and, and then natural selection slowly sorts them over time. He's saying when you start with pre-existing variation, you don't have to come up with all that variation. It's already there, therefore it can act more rapidly. He says, effectively, the model of pre-existing heterozygosity, there it is again, again, love saying it, eliminates the most time-intensive step of the speciation process under the evolutionary model, which again makes sense. You, you start with all the variation, you don't need to generate it. To clarify, the model of pre-existing genetic diversity invokes multiple mechanisms as the second step, and he's going to list some, natural selection, migration, genetic drift, etc. Now, those of you that were here for my 2021 talk or have seen it online, uh, you'll know that these are the exact same mechanisms or exact same things invoked as mechanisms of evolution. And I discussed those. So let's talk about these that he mentioned here. So he talked about natural selection, migration, genetic drift, and then others. So he didn't specifically mention others, but, but he's referring to things like gene flow, non-random uh, non mating, etc. And again, I'm not going to spend time talking about it today. I would refer you to my 2021 presentation. But essentially, we looked at these things and discovered that gene flow, non-random mating, and some of these others 
are simply mechanisms that redistribute variation. They're not the source of variation. They don't, they don't select, they're, they're not a mechanism of any kind, they simply redistribute variation. So let's look at these others, and we'll start in reverse order here with genetic drift. So what is genetic, genetic drift, and is it a mechanism of adaptive variation? Well, we'll go back to Khan Academy here. At Khan Academy has these you know, great little learning um, uh, helps, I guess, learning aids to explain a lot of different complex concepts, and evolution is one of them. And so I'm just going to borrow from their diagrams here. So this is the idea of genetic drift. And we're going to go back to those beetles again. Um, so you've got your dark beetles and light beetles here. And the idea is in genetic drift that for some reason, some chance event eliminates just by chance some of the population, in this case, in this example, it's the three white beetles, right? And so, I'm sorry, it's the opposite. Only the three white beetles survive. It eliminates all the rest of these. And as a result, in the next generation, the only kind of beetles you can have are white ones because it eliminated these. Now, they weren't eliminated because they were better fit to the environment or worse fit to the environment or any other reason. It simply happened by chance. Things happen, you know, hurricanes, avalanches, um, you know, droughts, famines. It just, things happen. And as a result, it eliminates those. So the idea here is, is a, randling, a random sampling of genes. There's no directed, there's no purposeful, it's not directed, it's simply random sampling of genes. And this happens, and it can be observed out there in nature all the time, actually. Um, the problem there is that it involves chance events which alter the size and the competition, uh, uh, composition of the gene pool. And because of that, it's not correlated at all with fitness for the environment. So it's just as likely to be maladaptive as adaptive. It's not a mechanism for adaptive variation. It's simply a mechanism that alters the gene pool <clears throat> for no particular reason. So it's not, it's not a mechanism for adaptive variation. So what about migration, the second one? So migration is fairly straightforward. Basically, it splits the gene pool. It requires isolation. You have a group of organisms that migrates away from the rest, and they're separated now. So the gene pool now has lost information from those migrating individuals. But here's the thing. It reduces the population size, which may actually adversely impact the survival of that organism. Because if something happens, you have fewer members that can survive and reproduce. So it's not very adaptive in that respect. Secondly, they don't necessarily change, uh, share the same genetic similarity um, when they migrate away. There could be any number of reasons why they've migrated away. So, they're, again, they don't necessarily have that genetic similarity. There's no particular adaptive reason for them migrating away, necessarily. So it's only adaptive if they already have adaptive variations that fit the new environment they migrate to. So the bottom line here is that, by itself, migration is not a mechanism for adaptive variation. Instead, there still requires a selective mechanism to select those adaptations that are fit for that environment and eliminate the ones that are not. So honestly, migration is not really a mechanism of adaptive variation. So we're stuck again with natural selection. And again, natural selection is really the only mechanism that's been asserted or is even theoretically plausible as a selective mechanism for adaptive variation. And so we'll go back just to refresh your memory to our exciting beetle and rock example. And again, the reason I bring this example up is because often predation is used as an example of natural selection. It's an easy one to, to conceptualize, right? You've got like the, the, you've all heard of the peppered moths on the trees where the trees were dark um, and then the trees were light and you had dark and light versions of pepper moths. And so obviously the, the uh, birds can see the, the light ones and they pick them off of dark trunks or vice versa. They can see the dark ones and the light trunks. And, and see my 2020 one presentation, but it's not quite like that. <laughs> it's not actually what's happening. But that's at least conceptually an idea. Um, it helps with the idea of natural selection. So, the, so again, it's the differential survival of genes. So differential simply being some genes survive and some don't, right? But the problem is natural selection is not an efficient or effective filter. And I talked about that. I kind of beat that to death in the 2016 presentation. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One of them is it's just really slow. Um, in addition to that, predation, which we just talked about, is actually more accurately described as genetic drift. And again, I went into that in my 21 presentation, but essentially, predation is usually a, a, a case of an animal being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
um, the predators aren't selecting animals based on their fitness. They're selecting animals based on the fact that it was there and it could get to it and it eats it. So it's really a random sampling. Um, so really, uh, honestly, again, if you're interested in, in going back and seeing the details about why I'm saying this, please do to the 2016 and 2021 presentation. But I'm just going to, as an article of faith right now, just say adaptation does not appear to be the result of natural selection. So if that's the case, then we've got some issues with the current creation model because observed adaptation is instead rapid. It's predictable, it's repeatable, it's reversible, and it's precisely controlled. So the question is, can the heterozygous fractionation model explain these things? Is it possible to conceive that it might be able to explain rapid, predictable, repeatable, reversible, precisely controlled adaptation? So the first question then to ask is, can pre-existing variation allow for rapid adaptation? And that's actually an argument that Jensen makes in that book. Uh, very, tries to make it very strongly, and you see the quote open with that too, and it's, hey, evolution, you know, it's slow, but with pre-existing variation, we can eliminate that slow step. So is that really, really the case? Well, yeah, significant variation can appear in one generation. If you've got a lot of variation that's built in, and, you know, reproduction is sort of randomly mixing those traits into the next generation, then you could get significant variation, significant divergence from the norm in, in as little as one generation. But that's not the key. You still have to have the variation selected and fixed in a population. Variation itself isn't the key. Is it, is it adaptive? So what do I mean by selected and fixed? So let's say you have a variation that uh, ends, ends up being adaptive but it only occurs in one or a few individuals. It has to be fixed in the whole population for that species then to move in that direction. That takes time. Now, he, Jensen argues it doesn't take nearly as much time, but that's somewhat debatable. But in any case, it's still, you still have to have time to fix that in the population. And of course, to be selected, that variation has to be adaptive. Otherwise, natural selection is a concept. It won't work. It has, there has to be an adaptive advantage to that variation. Just variation by itself doesn't mean adaptation is more rapid. It has to be adapted, so therefore it has to be selected. So the question really is, what's the probability that a randomly generated variation is going to be adaptive? That's a very important question if you're arguing that the model is going to be much faster, much more rapid at adaptation. What's the probability that that randomly generated variation is going to be adaptive? But there are other questions important here too. So, if it's not adaptive, the only way to fractionate it or separate it in the population is by genetic drift. You have to randomly sample and eliminate some and, and, and uh, save others. So the question then becomes, what's the impact of that on the speed of adaptation? Because again, genetic drift can be just as equally adaptive as maladaptive, right? It doesn't, it doesn't it's random. It's a random sampling. So if you're trying to rapidly adapt a population, but you're getting random sampling of variation, it may set it back, it may move it forward. Hard to say. So those are two important questions that have to be asked here. And as far as I know, those questions have not been answered. So honestly, what we have here is it's debatable whether it's rapid. But also, it's debatable whether or not it's predictable because if you've got a random process, how predictable is that? So these first two items that we observe with actual adaptation, that it's rapid and it's predictable, are quite debatable and questionable with the model of pre-existing variation. So what about the repeatable and reversible aspects of it? Can you get repeatable and reversible adaptation if you're fractionating the pre-existing adaptation out? Well, there's a big problem with that, and that is loss of information. It's because remember, variations are controlled by genetics. Genetics is information. So if you eliminate the information because you're fractioning it out, how do you go back to where you started? Hey, let me give you an example here. So you've probably all heard this example of dogs with long fur and short fur and, and fur in between. And this is shown as an example of natural selection. So as an example here, you've got, you've got original dogs in the gene pool and you've got an Arctic wolf that has thick fur genes and, and dogs with thick fur genes flourish in a cold climate. Then you've got African wild dogs, which came from here as well, and they have thin fur genes, and they flourish in the hot climate. So they're saying this is an example of natural selection. You started with uh, 
you know, with a gene pool that got fractionated out into thick and thin fur. And more specifically, this is how this is thought to work. If you started with dogs in the middle that had medium length fur, and you've got two different alleles for, for fur here, you've got a long and a short, and they both had that. When you fractionate that out, those that end up with just the two short have short fur, and those that end up with one of each have medium fur, just like the originals, and those that end up with two of the L, the large capital Ls, have long fur. And if these two dogs are eliminated, then all you've got left is the ones with long fur, and they can only have long fur. How do you reverse that process? Right, the information's lost, it's gone. There are no longer this little S. It's not there. But an even more dramatic example that you've probably all heard of is antibiotic resistance. And so in antibiotic resistance, basically what happens is you've got these bacteria that they produce an enzyme that processes the antibiotic and turns it into a toxin. So the, the antibiotic by itself doesn't kill the organism. The organism actually produces an enzyme which processes that antibiotic and that turns it into a toxin or a poison. Well, as it turns out, there are actually bacteria out there that don't have that enzyme. They don't produce an enzyme. And so when you apply the antibiotic, the ones that have the enzyme that are normal, they die because the antibiotic turns into a toxin. The ones that don't have it, they live. And so the population gets a higher and higher percentage of those that don't have that enzyme, and so they're resistant to that antibiotic, so they no longer are killed by it. And now you've got a problem in places like hospitals and other places like that where you've used a lot of antibiotics and you've killed off all those that are affected by it and you're left with only those that aren't. And so you can't do anything about it and you can't keep people from getting sick as a result. And so, again, the question in both of those examples, the second one being particularly stark, you know, you've lost the information to produce the enzyme. How do you reverse that? The information is gone, right? So, it seems quite unlikely that in the model of heterozygous fractionation, pre-existing variation, that you can, you can predict, explain the repeatability and the reversibility of the adaptation that we can actually observe in nature. So the question is, is information really lost during adaptation? Because that's obviously key to whether or not this model can work. So let's look at the example of antibiotic resistance again. So, it's not quite as simple as this. Further study has shown the following. It has shown that there are similar mutations that appear to recur repeatedly across a number of different types of bacteria. They all end up with the same mutation. So it's starting to not look accidental, right? So the question is, is that repeatable? Does that mean it's repeatable? Can it be repeated in the same population? It seems to be repeated across others. And also, it's been observed that if you remove the antibiotic and put them out in the wild, so to speak, they don't survive very long. Um, those that have the, the mutation. So the question then becomes, is it reversible, at least at a population point of view? You start with a population that doesn't have the resistance, then the population almost all has resistance, and then you go back to the population not having the resistance anymore. But the only way to, to answer that question is actually there's two critical questions to ask about this scenario to determine what's really going on here. The first is this. Do those resistant bacteria, do they actually pre-exist in the population before the antibiotic is applied? Or do they only show up after the antibiotic is applied? So in other words, the first one would be, hey, it just happened by chance, they just happened to be there, and you just eliminated everyone else, which is why you're seeing them. Or is it the case that the population doesn't have their resistance, and you apply the antibiotic and they respond by developing the resistance? That's a key question. Another key question is, when you remove that antibiotic, do those bacteria that arise in the new population that are non-resistant, do they arise as direct descendants of those that are resistant, or do the resistant ones just die out and are replaced? That's another critical question because it speaks to whether or not this is reversible and repeatable or if it's a loss of information. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, those questions have not been answered. So we don't know the answer to that question, and it'd be great for someone to do a study and find that out, because then we'll know if information loss is really happening in this case. But not to do a pun, but all is not lost. <laughs> we can look at a different example, a similar example of a bacteria to see if we can get an insight into what's really going on. And as it just so happens, there is a great example of that. This is E. coli, 
which, as you know, is something that oftentimes makes you very sick. Um, in fact, one of my daughters who's here today in the audience, um, when she was young, she got an E. coli infection that uh, made her seriously ill when she was really, really young. Um, and it was, you know, had to treat it with antibiotics, of all things. Um, but anyway, so some experiments have been done on E. coli. And uh, you start with, this, with a single population and separate it into three different populations, kept separately, different test tubes, et cetera. And here's what they found. They fed these E. coli easy to digest glucose and hard to digest acetate. They can eat both, they can switch back and forth between the two. Now the reason why this is, with, is appropriate to talk about here in relation to the antibiotic resistant is remember the reason why those bacteria died is because they processed the, the antibiotic, right? So they essentially they ate it. So this is a similar thing. They're not doing antibiotics here, but they're doing glucose and acetate. So when they fed the population this, what they found is that all three populations diverged into specialized form. You had one that was specialized on feeding on glucose and one that was specialized to feed on acetate. Um, but here's what's even more interesting. When one of those two food sources was exhausted by the population, the bacteria switched back to doing the other one. So this is reversible. They could do both. They specialized in one or the other, and when one ran out, they switched back to the other one. So here's what uh, the paper, research paper by Heron and, and Debelli said about this. He said, they said, the population is diversified into two existing ecotypes representing different physiological adaptations. We found that similar but independently evolved phenotypes, which is uh, an expression of genes, often shared mutations in the same gene and in four cases shared identical mutations at the same nucleotide position. That's interesting. It doesn't sound random. Um, and in this article in Nature News reported on the same experience, they said this. In the new study, the authors went back to the frozen samples from three of their test tubes and sequenced 17 gene samples from various stages of the experiment. The DNA showed that in some cases, identical mutations appeared independently in all three test tubes, despite the random mutation, nature of mutations. The same change in the environment favored the same genetic solutions. See what they're saying? Identical mutations appear despite the random nature of mutations. That's a very confused statement. If they're identical and appearing in the same spot, they're not random. And further, they said that Debelli and Heron also found that some mutations occurred only in a specific order. After one group had become specialized for glucose and the other for acetate, both groups evolved to switch better between meal types. That last mutation would not have been useful until after the emergence of the first, which helped exhaust food supplies faster. You see what they're saying? Not only did the mutations that are supposedly random occur in the same spot, and they're the same mutations, but they also occurred in a specific order. Again, not sounding very random. So in conclusion, identical mutations occurred in three independent populations. And they occurred in a specific order, first removing and then restoring the ability to switch between the food types. So this is not a loss of information, but instead it's precisely controlled modification of information in response to changes in food availability. No information was lost here. The information was there to begin with, that they had specialized, that they started generalized, became specialized, then became generalized again. That same information was there at the beginning, it was at the end, and the changes, the mutations, which are changes in the genetic code, were not random, happened in the same places, happened in a specific order. So I think it's safe to say that what we're seeing is not loss of information. Therefore, repeatable, reversible, and even precisely controlled cannot be explained by loss of information. Therefore, heterozygous fact fractionation is not the source of adaptive variation. It just can't be. That's not what's going on. That's not what we're seeing. Which is a problem, because that means the current creation model is invalid. So how do we solve the problem? How does adaptation really work? So the first an observation. Oops, that's not the right button. There we go. First an observation, organisms are responsive, not passive. What do I mean by that? They're equipped with an incredible array of sensors that are tuned to specific environmental variables. This is an emerging field of study. Let me give you a few examples. 
So these examples would include light polarization, magnetic field direction, and strength used for navigation, for instance, in fish, in salmonids. Um, another example would be humidity, temperature, salinity, conductivity, and fluid flow exam uh, sensors for habitat suitability. And this could be something like, say, a fruit fly. Um, and there's also pheromones and chem chemicals that are sensed, which can be used for predator or hazard avoidance or even meal or habitat, uh, mate and habitat uh, detection. Well, in cases of some insects, the mate is the meal. So I guess that makes sense. Um, so these sensors are very specific. They detect very specific conditions, and they have um, predetermined stimuli. They have thresholds, and they're, they're very precise. So what happens when something sense? Well, it triggers a biochemical response cascade um, when that threshold is met. And it, honestly, it looks very much like a tracking system, like a human-made tracking system. What, what's a tracking system have? It has sensors which detects pre-specified conditions. Let's say a tracking system, uh, an anti-missile defense system. It's tracking, it's looking for a heat plume from a missile. That's a pre-specified condition. Then there's an algorithm which determines what to do if it finds it. It's an if-then response, right? So see a heat-seeking missile, get yourself in tracking mode, get ready to take it out, right? And then there's an output. They adjust the internal state or the external behavior. So it, it can adjust tracking, it can launch a missile, whatever. That's a tracking system. So organisms appear to have tracking systems. So do you guys remember Darwin's finches? If you were here in 2021, I talked about this, and, or you may remember it from a biology textbook or, or evolution class or whatever. But here's a, a drawing of Darwin's finches. The primary thing about Darwin's finches that's noticeable is the variation in beaks. So here you'll see you've got a really large tall beak here all the way down to kind of a thin small beak there. And what's been determined is that there's a correlation between beak variation and habitat and diet. And so this is just a chart that shows you the different kind of beak variation. This is from a large ground finch here all the way over to a tree finch here that's vegetarian. And the different um, beak sizes correlate with where they live and what they eat. But what's really interesting about these is that a lot of studies have been done about beak variation over time. And here's an example, a chart from one of those studies. So beak depth on this, what we're talking about here is basically the height of the beak, right? And this is a study done on a medium ground finch. And uh, this was done from the mid 70s to the mid 80s, so over the course of about a decade. And what they discovered is that the size of the beak depth, so going up on the, on the chart here is a larger beak, a taller beak, beak depth going down is the other way. The size goes up in a dry year and then it kind of levels back to the normal median or average, and it goes back up in dry year, but, and then a wet year does the opposite. And so year to year, these finch beaks track with their environment, and they do it very closely, and they do it very rapidly. So they appear to track with the changes in the precipitation in particular. The idea being that, you know, as the climate dries out, the larger beak is more helpful to crack open nuts or other things that, that would be harder to get into if they were soft because they're wet, basically, is the idea. Um, so anyway, these changes are very rapid, but they're also predictable. With a dry climate, the beak depth goes up. With a wet climate, it goes down. And it's repeatable. It happens again and again and again in the population. And it's reversible. Dry year, it goes one way. Wet year, it goes the other. But it's even more interesting than that, because when, when researchers started looking at the beaks themselves and how they were, how they were uh, created or developed um, in embryo and juvenile birds, um, they discovered something really interesting. You'd think that maybe the beak variation in size was sort of, you know, kind of uh, maybe random or not necessarily directed, but here's what they discovered instead. They discovered they're actually conic sections. So let me just read this real quick. It says, on small phylogenetic scales, beak shapes collapse under scaling alone. For example, the two Geospecies species in the top left, so the Geospecies Darwin's finches, um, creating groups of similar beak shapes. These groups share, or shapes in turn collapse onto each other under shear in their length direction. Specifically, all group shapes collapse onto the shape of the blue-colored group. So that's up here, the blue-colored group. Um, this blue-colored group can be approximated to an extremely high precision as a section of a parabola, as shown on the right. So this is the parabola. So they, the beak shapes fit to this parabola very precisely. There's no, they're not randomly created at all. They're mathematically defined. The, this combination of hierarchical collapse under scaling and shear onto the blue color group and the collapse of the blue color group on a parabola lead to the conclusion 
that all beak shapes considered here are conic sections. So here's uh, what they said, Fritz et al. in 2014 paper uh, described what they found. They said, to further quantify the diversity of shapes, we fit polynomial functions, we're talking math here, right? Not random chance, math, to the beak profiles and searched for the beak shape with the simplest functional form. This turns out to be geospecia in the Darwin's finches, which are fit well to within the area of our methods for recording shapes by a parabola, y equals ax squared plus bx. The sheer collapse of all other songbird beaks, all other songbird beaks, not just Darwin's finches, all other songbird beaks, this isn't just them, this is happening with all the songbirds, implies that all beak profiles are well fit by an equation of the form zero equals ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey. This is a mathematically precisely defined shape. There's nothing random about this at all. It's precise, precisely defined by math. They further say, the present study significantly limits the potential set of parameters that can be optimized since the intrinsic developmental pathways place strong constraints on the set of beak shapes that are actually produced. In other words, if it don't fit a conic section, it's not produced. There's no, there's no randomness here at all. Any optimization can only occur within the subspace of shapes that is readily available to the existing beak developmental pathway. This is a fancy way of saying this happens when they're embryonic, before they're born. This process is precisely, tightly controlled. So essentially, the appropriate beak morphology for the changing conditions is chosen during embryonic development, and it's precisely controlled by the organism itself. And again, it happens during embryonic development. This is, this is not something that happens as the adult. This is not something that happens from differential survival and reproduction. It's something that happens as it's developing as an embryo. And that's honestly best described as engineered optimization. What is that? Well, we'll go back to the dictionary here. Optimization is an act, process, or methodology of making something, such as a design, system, or decision, as fully perfect, functional, or effective as possible. Specifically, the mathematical procedures, such as finding the maximum of a function involved in this. We just saw that these beak shapes fit a function. They are optimized beak shapes. Keep it in that wrong button. So let's compare the two models here about ad adaptive variation. I've just said it's an engineered response. It's not random at all. It's not natural selection. So on the left, we have non-designed random process, which would be natural selection or some other similar selective force that's external. And we have engineered optimization on the right. The first is undirected. It's a struggle for survival. The second is purposeful. It's optimization for a particular niche. The first is, is implying that passive organisms are acted on by external forces, they're shaped by their environment. Whereas in engineered optimization, they're shaped by internal forces, they're responding to the environment, they're not shaped by it. The first is inefficient, it's trial and error, it's hit and miss, remember the random nature of it, the fractionation of it, it's, all, it's random, it's not directed. The second is targeted, and because of that, it's predictable, it's repeatable, it's reversible, it's precisely controlled. The first is slow, it's gradual, it's successive, it's slight, it has to be, it's hit and miss, right? It's random. The second is rapid, it's fully implemented in one or a few generations because it's targeted, it's purposeful. So in 2021, when I was here, I came up with a framework to describe what we're seeing. Um, it's called the TTAM framework, and it stands for Tracking of Environmental Conditions, by which I mean adaptation is responsive, it's not passive. Targeting of solutions for those conditions, by which I mean that adaptation is targeted, it's not trial and error. The A is assembly of traits. So adaptation occurs during development. It's not after the fact, so there's nothing to select. It happens in development. There's nothing to select once it's developed. And then the M stands for modification of traits, which is that adaptation is adjustable, it's not static. So that's a model to explain what's going on with engineered optimization, which is adaptation. So the question is, coming back to it, the, the title of the talk, what is the source of adaptive variation? We just described what it looks like. What's the source of it? It's the organism itself. The organism is the source of that adaptive variation. So that's not enough to say they're the source, though. How does that work? What's the mechanism? Well, I don't know if you remember this, but I... I uh, sort of did a, a shock reveal slide in 2021, and I said, it's Bitcoin. And what do I mean by that? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Bitcoin or not, so I'll describe it real quickly, but basically Bitcoin uh, is, a, is a, it's a monetary system which is run by something called blockchain. 
It's a currency network. And blockchain is a distributed problem-solving algorithm is what it is. And it can be used whenever you need a distributed consensus to establish it. That's why hackers can't hack in and make their own Bitcoin because there's literally tens of thousands of computers that are, are, have a consensus agreeing on what everyone has in their account to simplify it. Um, so how does that work? Well, so you need a network of computers. Each network is referred to as a node and they maintain a single record of transactions across the entire, entire network and that's called a ledger. And that's why it can't be hacked, because that's maintained by thousands and thousands of computers, and they all agree. The transactions that happen are grouped into a block that is chained to the previous block, hence a blockchain. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, so a new block is added when you do a transaction, and, and it's added by solving a complex mathematical problem. And so that's called mining. Um, you, and it's solved by using data from the previous block plus an irreversible mathematical function. It's a cryptographic hash function for those that are into coding and want to be specific. Um, that means that each block has information from the previous block and is connected to it in an irreversible manner. So you can't just make up a, a, a block in the ledger, a transaction, because it's all connected together to the one that just happened. So a blockchain is actually a close analogy for what's going on. Um, it's presumably a distributed algorithm that allows to generate the organisms to generate this adaptive variation and I actually have labeled that trait chain. So if I keep hitting that wrong button, sorry about that. So so let's compare the two so you can understand what I'm talking about by analogy. So on the left is blockchain, on the right is trait chain. So blockchain requires a network, which is a group of connected computers. Trait chain requires a population, which is a group of connected organisms. In blockchain, the node is a discrete computer that generates the blocks, and in trait chain, an individual is a discrete organism that generates traits. A ledger is a digital file that requires transaction, while on the trait chain side, it's DNA. It's a molecular structure that records variables, it records information. A block is a group of transactions that's linked to a previous block, whereas a trait is a group of variables linked to a parental trait. And mining is the process of solving a computational, computational problem to generate those blocks. And basically, it's arrived at by guessing a random number. So you need a lot of computing power to run a whole bunch of guesses until you get it right. Whereas in trait chain, it's development, not mining. And that is solving a biological problem to generate a trait. And the solution is arrived at by the organism adjusting its own internal state. So this results in a cryptographic, a cryptographic hash function, which is irreversible mathematical operation on the blockchain side, and that generates a unique alphanumeric, uh, alphanumeric code. On the trade chain side, it's an adaptive hash function, which is an irreversible biological operation, happens during development, that results in a unique and optimized DNA code. So if blockchain is analogous to the way in which adaptive variation is engineered by the organisms, then the adaptive traits result from a biological function based on a couple of inputs. Here they are. Inherited information, so the previous trait from the parent, and information gleaned by sensing the environment. So those are the new variables. So then there are also internal resources available at the time when that trait is generated. The animal state, how much, you know, how healthy they are, how much um, you know, energy they've got, their food resources, their, their, their specific DNA, their, where they're at at the time in terms of geological, uh, geographic location, et cetera. That's their, that all affects their internal state. So here's how I would look at this as a formula if you write it out. So in the blockchain is above. So there's a threshold that's greater than this function, which involves previous block, new transactions, and novel value. In the trade chain, it's constraints, which are greater than a function, and the previous block is a previous trait. The new transaction are new variables from sensing the environment, and the novel value corresponds to the internal state of the organism. So, taking it back to the TTAM framework, here's where the tracking affects the new variables. The targeting affects, it's a, new, a combination of the new variables and the previous trait. The assembly involves the whole thing, the internal state, and then modification does as well. So, I just described for you the mechanism of variation. What is it? It's trait chain. So, question, how do organisms solve this function? If it's really a mathematical 
block-like, blockchain-like function. How do they solve that function? Well, let's go back and look at a model that was proposed in 2014 about how DNA actually works. So Michael Soltis proposed this in 2014, and he compares DNA to a computer program. Um, in his model, both the instructions and the data are combined in a single stream, just like computer code. And though the code is bounded by fixed top-level instructions, there's input data called variables which enable variation. What that means is this formula here. You've got top-level instructions are the constraints, and the variables are the combination of the previous trait, the new variables, and the internal state. So here's what he says about the model, comparing computer code to DNA. He says, using abstraction, computer programs can also dynamically load, move, and control portions of instruction code called subroutines or functions during execution to perform their job. It's even possible for a computer program to generate sections of programming code on the fly, turn them on and off, and call them in different orders. But it's always a computation of results of information at a higher level. No matter how many layers of abstraction you have in a computer system, there's always a top-level instruction set that controls everything below it. So it's not a free-for-all. You can't get unlimited change. You've got parameters, but within those parameters, the, the computer can dynamically load, move, and control code. It can even rewrite and generate code and do it on the fly. So what I'm going to submit to you is that organisms solve the tray chain function in a similar way. Here's an example of people seeing this in action. This is from a paper in 2017 in, in PLOS Biology. It says, the impact of transcription on DNA damage in a, is well understood, but our research reveals a pathway by which mutations, mutation again meaning just change in information, can be directed to particular loci in a particular environments, and furthermore, that this mutagenic process can be regulated through histone acetylation. Simulated CNV, therefore, represents an unanticipated and remarkably controlled, controllable pathway facilitating organismal adaptation to new environments. Evidence for adaptation through genome-wide non-random mutation is substantial, particularly in bacteria. What he's saying is adaptation, the organisms achieve adaptation through genome-wide non-random mutation. <clears throat> Here's a quote from Shapiro in 2014. He says, mobile DNA in the genome is subject to RNA-targeted epigenetic control. This control regulates the activity of transposons, retrotransposons, and genomic proviruses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many different life history experiences alter the activities of mobile DNA and the expression of genetic loci regulated by nearby insertions. The same experiences include alterations in epigenetic formatting and lead to transgenerational, so beyond just the parent, also the offspring, modifications of genome expression and stability. These observations lead to the hypothesis that epigenetic formatting directed by non-coding DNA provides a molecular interface between life history events and genome alteration. What's he saying? What's he saying is the, the, the organism is impacted by the environment, responds to the environment, and changes its DNA using non-coding RNA <clears throat> to do that. One more quote from Shapiro. He says, recent applications of high-resolution technologies to genome expression in animals reveal a dynamic, four-dimensional, interactive control architecture incompatible with prior notions that genomes contain discrete functional segments of DNA called genes. This is sounding an awful lot like the computer program, changing things on the fly, calling, rewriting, et cetera. The same thing seems to be happening with DNA. So the answer to the question, how do organisms solve their trait chain function is they modify their DNA. And we're gonna see examples of that in action because we're gonna take a break. Uh, get Phil back up here to tell us about these uh funny things going on inside these animals. <clears throat> Thanks, J.D. Okay. So, <clears throat> I apologize if, if my voice gets a little scratchy. I actually woke up with a sore throat this morning. Shockingly enough, it always seemed to happen when I'm going to speak. <clears throat> so I'll try my best to make it through the last, last portion of the presentation here. So, <clears throat> Where we left off is talking about applying this TTM framework or TTAM framework to ongoing research results. So I'm going to actually only just 
talk, I'm gonna go a little more in depth, so I'm only gonna talk about two examples. If you're looking for more examples of this kind of thing in action, you can go back to my 2021 presentation. Essentially, what I'm talking about now is research that's happened since then um, and is kind of give, give a lot more detail. So, the first thing we're gonna talk about is um, Astyonyx mexicanus, what's that? Well, that is the blind cave fish, which you probably have heard of. Um, this is often shown as a sort of an icon example of evolution. Um, it's also been featured a lot in uh, creationism presentations. So what are blind cave fish? Well, they're essentially Mexican tetras in this example. Um, and here you've got your sighted fish. This lives in the streams out, you know, outside. Um, and it's, it has quite a bit of color and functional eyes, et cetera. Uh, and then you've got your blind cave fish, which lives nearby uh, in caves with very low light, and it has very little pigmentation and, generally speaking, no eyes. Um, the, it's oftentimes, there's a lot of different uh, species of these, but it's often that the eyes are completely gone. In some cases, they're just severely diminished. <clears throat> so the background uh, here is that the number of cave fish species is probably more than 230. Um, they're found on all continents of, except Antarctica. So this is, a, this is not an isolated example. This happens all over the world. And so they're a great example of an organism to study to look at adaptive change, because obviously it's pretty dramatic to lose your eyes and all your color. And so all of these species are thought to have descended from, uh, that are in the cave, are thought to have descended from fish that have eyes, of sighted fish. Um, and there's a lot of different species, like I said, over 230 probably, and they all developed these same adaptations, loss of eyes, loss of pigmentation, independently. Um, this particular one, the Mexican tetra, uh, is found in 29 known caves across northeastern Mexico. Um, and genetic studies have suggested that there was five separate invasions, so to speak, into the caves from the rivers um, of the surface-dwelling fish. And there's also been a lot of gene flow uh, among these different cave dwelling populations in these caves. That means that the species have, have interacted. There have been you know, back and forth uh, examples of fish migrating around and sharing their genes. So uh, the genomes are uh, nearly identical. They're considered a single species. And by that I mean both the sighted fish and the ones in the caves, all the different cave um, fish populations, they're, they're considered the same species and living in different areas and obviously looking dramatically different. Um, so how is this dramatic difference explained? Well, in neo-Darwinism, so the current evolutionary theory, the idea is that the loss of eyes and the pigmentation results from, shockingly enough, a random mutation plus natural selection. Um, and they're actually shown as an example for evolution, icon of evolution, of evolution in action, a natural selection in action. You can see the dramatic change because of a random mutation natural selection. So they're, they're thought of as a great example. In the current creation model, which we talked about, the heterozygous fractionation, the idea is that the loss of eyes and pigmentation is from the loss of information, which is from a, a random mutation plus natural selection. So in other words, they're pretty much the same explanation. And, and don't take my word for it, take the display from the Creation and Earth History Museum in Santee, California, which is where ICR used to be located, no longer there. Here's what the display says. It says, the genetic information is copied and passed on generation after generation. Occasionally, there are copying mistakes known as mutations. This is the idea of random mutation. When a mutation occurs in a light environment that causes animals' offspring not to have eyes, it is an enormous disadvantage, which is obvious. If you can't see, you're going to bump into things. Um, so natural selection eliminates this flaw. When the eyeless defect occurs here in a cave, it does not give any disadvantage, and so it's not eliminated. In fact, it gives advantages. Eventually, selective pressures ensure that all are eyeless. These ghostly fish swim blindly as prime examples of how mutation and natural selection lead to a reduction of functioning systems as complex genetic information has been corrupted or lost. This is a creationist explanation, not an evolutionist explanation. You can see that they are essentially identical. Loss of information. Okay, so the question is, does adaptive variation in blind cave fish really result from a loss of information? To answer that question, the Institute for Creation Research has recently done a bunch of experiments on 
sighted in blind cave fish. Um, and here's an example of some of the fish that they're using in their experiments. Here's, your, of course, your sighted version with the full eyes and the color, and there's your blind cave fish version. So they actually um, took one morphotype, a morphotype just being a, a specific example of expressions of genes and body form, et cetera, um, of surface-dwelling fish, and they also took multiple mul morphotypes of cave-dwelling fish to do these experiments. So here's what they did. They exposed the cave fish to high-intensity light over a period of several months. Separately, they exposed cave fish to ambient light, so just normal, you know, not, not light, just kind of the light around, um, and high carbon dioxide, which is low pH. In addition to that, they also took another group of the sighted cave fish and they exposed them to low light, low dissolved oxygen, and moderately high carbon dioxide levels, which would be considered um, not ideal for the sighted fish. In fact, in their experiments, they, the sighted fish reacted in the way you would expect. They had a hard time breathing and they behaved strangely because they were under stress. So what they did is they exposed these different groups in these different ways to light, low pH, et cetera. And what they did is they compared the regions in these fishes' bodies that have chromatophores. Those are the cells that, that give the color. So specifically, there's melanic or melanin um, type, which is the same, same type of, uh, of biochemical uh, substance that gives you a tan. Um, and then also there's iridescent ones, which humans don't have, unfortunately. I think that there's quite a few people that would love to have those. At least younger folks, anyway. Um, so, so they exposed and they compared those regions in the fish. And you can see here in the, in the um, image that there's arrows at a bunch of the different regions that they were comparing. So I took these images directly from um, a paper that uh, ICR actually uh, presented in last, last summer, 2023, at the International Conference on Creations among these experiments. And so that's what those arrows are all about. So what they observed was there were rapid changes in all of the exposed groups in a matter of weeks under these treatments. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. So this top one is a cave fish, a blind cave fish. You can see it has no pigment and it has no eyes. And it was exposed to ambient light for several months, and that's what it looked like after being exposed to ambient light. So instead of being dark, it was exposed to just you know, normal ambient light, and that's what it looked like. Still pretty much the same, maybe a little change, but pretty much the same. Um, then they exposed to the high intensity light for 45 days, and here's what happened. And this is the same fish, by the way, as this one. And you can see it looking darker. And then they exposed that same fish to 72 days. This is what it looked like after 72 days. Same fish, much darker. So you had a progression from very light, no pigmentation essentially, or very little, although, you know, some iridescent pig pigmentation, but all the way to quite dark. And that happened in only 72 days. That happened in just a matter of weeks. So this isn't theory. This is actual experiments. These are actual fish, actual animals. We're seeing adaptation in action. This is how it actually works. So... After the slight exposure, there was an increase in the melanic uh, pigmentation across all the body regions in the cave fish where their melanin is expressed in the sighted fish. So, so it wasn't just that they got more color, it's that those specific regions where the sighted fish have the most intense color, that's where the cave fish started having color. And also, um, there was an apparent increase in the iridescent chromatophores, and of course the sighted ones are more iridescent as well. So it's affecting the same areas as the sighted fish, which they are the same species as, and which they presumably descended from originally um, when exposed to light. And that's really interesting because these changes are, of course, predictable. Why do I say that? Well, because melanin and the other uh, color cells are, one of their main functions is to protect um, skin and organs. I and mean, that's why you get a suntan. It's your body protecting your skin when you're being exposed to sunlight. And of course, as blind cave fish in a dark environment in a cave, they don't need that protection. But when you expose them to light, it only makes sense that they would need that protection, right? Well, and that's exactly how they respond. It's predictable. So let's look at this on uh, what might be going on from the perspective of trait chain. Remember that formula I put up? We've got a constraint, which is greater, which all the constraint means is it can only operate within certain bounds. So it's designed and it's limited. We're not talking evolution here, we're talking adaptation, and it's a design solution. 
So we had a previous trait, new variables, and an internal trait. Uh, internal state. So what would that look like? So this is the tracking area I was talking about from before, where they're sensing the, the environment, and as a result, there's some new variables being introduced. So what's happening here is that we're getting highlight exposure. Those are the new variables that the creature is experiencing. It hasn't experienced the highlight before, now it is. Those are new variables that are coming into this equation. So in the tracking, or in the targeting stage, where the, the organism is now targeting a response to this new situation that's been exposed to, we're looking at the previous trait and the new variable. So what that looks like is when you have highlight exposure, it's interacting with the previous trait, which is minimal melanin. It doesn't have much pigmentation. That's the previous trait. So those two are involved in the process. And then you've got the assembly. So assembly is, you know, what am I going to do as a result? I'm going to assemble a solution. So there, again, you've got your highlight exposure, your minimal melanin, and then you've got a latent, so not, not working, melanin synthesis, synthesis pathway, can't say that, um, that's the current state with the new variables. So how does the organism solve this function to generate the appropriate new trait to respond to the fact that it's got high light exposure? Well, it adjusts its internal state. So it reactivates that melanin synthesis pathway, and that results in increased melanic production or pigmentation. It's a logical engineering tracking solution to the problem it encounters. So after that, we're looking at fish that were exposed. We're looking actually at a parent and an offspring. This is a next generation fish. So obviously that looks different than the first generation fish before it was exposed to light. But here's what's really interesting about that. So the offspring, they develop a more pronounced pattern of pigmentation in the same areas as their parents. So notice this word, developed. What does that mean? They didn't start that way. Instead, what happened is they also started with low pigmentation and got pigmentation, but they did it twice as fast as their parents. So there's been a ratchet occurring. The offspring already is predisposed to producing this melanin, and it does it twice as fast. In addition to that, it also, in the offspring, it's expressing pigmentation in new areas that the parent didn't express. So it's moving, it's changing, it's, obser it's, it's observed adaptation occurring, and it's repeatable. The parents did it, the offspring are doing it. It's repeatable. So what that means is the parent, after making the change itself, then modified the information that it uses to create a trait. How does that work? Well, remember, to generate this new trait, it reactivated a melanin synthesis, uh, synthesis path. I can't, why can I not say that word? Synthesis, thank you. <laughs> so it reactivated a melanin synthesis pathway um, and increased the production, but it didn't stop there because this was a permanent change, right? Because it interacted with the minimal melanin, and actually now the trait that it has is increased melanin, which it then passed on to its offspring, so that when the offspring encounters the highlight exposure, what it's dealing with is a trait from its parent that has changed. The ability to generate a solution has ratcheted toward the solution. So for the offspring, when exposed to highlight, highlight they already are dealing with an increased melanin ability passed on from the parent. And so that interacts with the reactivated melanin pathway, which has also been passed on from the parent. And the end result is that you get a broader spatial pattern of this than the parent had. So the parent adjusted and adapted, but the uh, offspring has been giving a leg up already on doing that same thing, and it does it more efficiently, more effectively, more quickly, uh, and to a greater extent than the parent. And so that means, of course, that after that, we've got, again, a change so that the offspring now has the trait of abundant melanin. So what's happening here is an iterative process. So I, I borrowed this from a business analyst's uh, presentation, actually. Um, so this is an example of an iterative process. Um, and so here, if you look in the top left here, you've got 
you've got your design, development, and testing in the first iteration, and it goes on to the same thing, design, development, testing, based on that first iteration, it does it again, and you keep going through these loops. So how does that correspond to what we're talking about? Well, we're talking about tracking, targeting, assembly, and modification. That's the TTM framework, right? So it corresponds. So you track what's going on in the environment, then you target, that's design, you assemble, which happens during development, and then ne afterwards you modify as necessary. That's testing, testing your new solution on the environment, modifying it as necessary. And that happens more than once. You go through your first iteration, it continues to track the environment, does the same thing again. Targeting, assembly, modification after it tracks, and so on through an iterative process all the way to the end. So that's what appears to be occurring here with these Cave fish are doing exactly that. They're developing an iterative solution. The goalposts are moving from one generation to the next, closer and closer to the optimal solution. So what's interesting about that is that's the blind cave fish. Now remember, the same species are also sighted cave fish. So do sighted cave fish do something similar to this? Well, of course, the answer is yes. I wouldn't be asking the question if that wasn't the answer, right? So, so this is an example of one of the sighted cave fish in the experiments. And Remember, these are exposed to minimal low light, so basically the opposite, you know, sort of simulating going into a cave. They've got minimal light, they've got low dissolved oxygen, and they have moderately high carbon dioxide. Um, and here's what happened. There was a noticeable reduction in the pigmentation in multiple areas, particularly around the eye. So you can see here's the eye. So this is the, the iris that surrounds the eye, and it's got lots of color here, and it's colorless there. You can see that these pigmentation up here and even the stripe here, it's all reduced. Interesting. Does that mean that the changes we're observing are reversible? Because we had the cave fish that had very little pigmentation and no eyes. We expose them to light and they get pigmentation. We have the sighted fish that have a lot of pigmentation. We reduce the light and increase the pH, which is what we would expect in a cave type environment. And what happens? They start re losing their pigmentation. So we've got the process going both directions. So how would that look from the perspective of this trait chain again? So we've got the low light, low oxygen, and higher pH exposure. Those are the new variables. And those new variables interact with the previous trait, which is abundant melanin. These are the sighted fish. They have plenty of pigmentation. And they also have an active melanin synthesis pathway. Synthesis pathway. Um, and, but that is no longer appropriate to the situation they find themselves. So they adjust their internal state by activating what's presumably a melanin removal pathway. And as a result, they end up with significantly reduced pigmentation. So this is the same kind of process that just happened that we just saw with the cave fish, but it's the opposite. As a result, of course, the new block in the chain is one with decreased melanin. So again, they're ratcheting toward a solution. So the third experiment was done, and I don't have any pictures of this one, but they also exposed cave fish to ambient light, normal dissolved oxygen, but then high carbon dioxide, low pH. So they basically lowered the pH for the blind cave fish. So they made it even more, um, you know, even lower pH than they would expect to be normally found in. And here's what they discovered. After six weeks, those cave fish that had very little pigmentation to start with, they had even less. In fact, in a lot of areas, they were, they, it was undetectable without a microscope. What's interesting about this is we've got a different environmental condition than the earlier experiment on these same kind of fish, right? The first one was high intensity light. The second one was low pH, but we get the same response. There's a change in the melanin levels and specifically they reduce. What that means is we've got two triggers for the same response, which, is, which suggests that there's a precise control mechanism going on here. This is not by chance. You've got two different triggers with the same exact response and an appropriate response, I might add. There's no, there's no chance involved here, right? This is, in fact, adaptive variation expressed and controlled, precisely controlled by the organism itself. There's that button again I keep hitting. Okay, so in this case, we had high pH exposure, that's the new variables, and we had a minimal melanin as a trait, because these are fish without a lot of pigmentation, these are cave fish, um, and that interacts with the fact that there's a latent melanin synthesis pathway, so in other words, these are fish that were not producing melanin, but that's not good enough, you need to remove the melanin, so they adjust their internal state by actually 
doing what's presumably a melanin removal pathway by changing to that state, and the result is that they have significantly reduced pigmentation. So what are the implications of these experiments? Well, first of all, the level of pigmentation in the cave fish and the sighted fish, which again, remember, is one species, is adjustable, not static. Now, in the idea of both evolution and in heterozygous fractionation, the pre-existing uh, variation plus natural selection, you have static changes. These are traits expressed during reproduction, and then they get selected, but that's not what's happening here. This is adjustable, it's not static. So we have increases with high light and decreases with low pH in the cave fish, and we have decreases in pigmentation with lower pH in the sighted fish. And here's what's interesting too, it's adaptive is iterative across the generations. We saw that, a second generation, it's ratcheted closer to the solution. But what's interesting is it was the ability to generate the trait that was inherited, not the trait itself. Remember that the fish exposed to light did the same thing as their parents, but did it twice as fast and in more areas. So this is not inheritance of a trait per se, but of the ability to generate a trait. Totally different concept. And the starting point shifted in a predictable direction, right? So we, we started with the cave fish that had very little pigmentation. We exposed them to more light and predictably, they shifted not only the adults, but the next generation toward the direction of more protective pigmentation. We started with the sighted fish and gave them lower light and higher pH, conditions that we would expect to find more in a cave as opposed to a river, and what happened? They predictably started losing their pigmentation. So it's predictable. And notice here also, in this very important natural selection played absolutely no role in this, right? Why do I say that? Well, first of all, the variation was gender, is not gender randomly, it's targeted. It happened in all the fish. You didn't get one fish that was darker and one fish that was lighter and then the darker fish died off, or the lighter fish died off so the darker fish predominated. That's not what happened. They all changed, the fish changed themselves. The individual fish changed, right? It was targeted. And there, like I said, there's no sorting of the darker or lighter fish by differential survival or reproduction. This adaptation occurred that had nothing to do with random variation, had nothing to do with differential survival. So this is precisely what would be expected from the TTM framework, right? So the individual fish adjusted their internal state to either activate or deactivate a melanin synth synthesis pathway. And it's exactly what we've been observing through adaptation. It's rapid, it happened in weeks, it was predictable because the increase or decrease was an appropriate response. It was repeatable because it occurred with all the individuals and both the adults and the offspring. It's reversible because we saw it go in both directions. And it's precisely controlled. And we, I'm making that assertion because there's more than one trigger for the same thing. So that's not an accident. That's an engineering, that's an engineering solution that has more than one stimulus to cause the trigger to go. So at, at this point, some of you may be saying, well, isn't this just epigenetics? Isn't this regulating DNA? I mean, we're not changing DNA here, right? We're just regulating it. We're just expressing or de-expressing pigmentation, right? Well, here's the, here's the issue with that. The distinction between epigenetics and genetics is being blurred. Is this epigenetic? Is it genetic? The distinction is being blurred here, and that's, this is turning out to be the case across a wide variety of experiments, across a wide variety of organisms. Epigenetics is a term that was coined to try to explain what was happening at least in my opinion, and what was happening with adaptation with these, these organisms generating by themselves modifications to their DNA to respond to the environment. And epigenetics primarily deals with uh, expression or de-expression of genes by adding things like methyl and, and other things to prevent the, the code from being, re uh, being read by RNA and then expressed. But it goes beyond that. Um, let me give you an example of why I say that. So two of these populations of fish ha have mutations which have been characterized as loss of function. They block pigment production. So that would be more classic to what you would think of as you know, the random mutation that removes the ability to do something. But it's more complicated than that, as it turns out, because 
those so-called loss of function mutations act as part of a network of other mechanisms that are not random. And in addition to that, it appears that they're regulated by transposable elements. So there's the, 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 the structure of the DNA itself and then the organism is involved with the fact that these so-called loss of function mutations have occurred. So this is not fully understood, but it appears that it's not a simple just mistake or error. It appears that the actual change or the block in function is purposeful. So it's not really, it appears it may not be really a loss of information at all, simply modification of information by breaking that particular pathway. Um, so further research is needed on this, and, and ICR has analyzed um, or is analyzing genetic samples. They took genetic samples as part of the experiment, and they're analyzing it, so the, the jury's still out on that. But remember that organisms do appear to be able to mutate their DNA by, by mutation. Again, remember, we just mean change or modification. It appears that organisms can, in fact, alter their DNA. So it's possible that's exactly what's going on in these so-called loss of function um, mutations. Um, so you could ask, well, isn't the loss of eyes a mutation? I mean, isn't that a fairly obvious, say, you had eyes, now you don't, so something broke and the eyes aren't, aren't made? Isn't that a mutation as opposed to epigenetics, just expressing or, or de-expressing eyes? And it would seem straightforward, but surprisingly, the answer to that question is no. That's not, that's not what's happening with eyes. So instead of trying to explain it, I'm going to, to uh, if you'd bear with me, I'm going to read a little section of the paper um, testing the cavefish model by ICR that reported on their experiment results and that was given at, at the 2023 um, ICC conference. So we'll just read this together. So it says, in a recent groundbreaking study on epigenetic mechanisms of eye loss in Astyonix cavefish, so the same cavefish we're talking about, the authors state that recent sequencing of the Pacon cavefish genome and other studies revealed no inactivating null mutations in essential eye development genes. Without such mutations, epigenetic regulation and modification of the genome are most likely to be involved in cavefish eye degeneration. Thus, mechanisms for shutting down eye development in cavefish, see the word that keeps showing up? Development. This is all happening in development. It's controlled by the creature. It's happening in development. It's not an after-the-fact selection event. Thus, mechanisms for shutting down eye development in cavefish as an adaptive response to cave conditions must be due to built-in systems that regulate traits at the level of the genome. One of the more easily determined epigenetic modifications involves cytosine methylation, where specified regulatory sections of the genome surrounding genes will have methyl groups attached to cytosine nucleotides along the genetic code. This is classic epigenetics. This type of site-directed methylation effectively downregulates or silences certain types of gene activity. Gore et al. determined that methylation-based epigenetic silencing was an adaptive mechanism for eye degeneration in Pacon cavefish. They discovered that DNA methylation of specific genomic sites confers eye-specific gene repression and also regulates early eye development. So this, again, is a purposeful, directed, self-directed response happening during development that removes the eyes before they're ever born. Also, multiple cavefish genes with promoter hypermethylation were reported to be associated with eye disorders in humans and mice. So it's not just cavefish. So it's happening in the same spot we would expect um, if it happened to humans or mice. These epigenetic data suggest that blindness in cavefish is inherent, pre-programmed, and adaptive. Therefore, mutations by which they mean random genetic errors, should be ruled out as having any selective value as credible explanations for eye loss in Astyonix cavefish. But in addition to that, there's also a really good um, hint that what's going on is, in fact, regulation based on response to the environment because of some other experiments that have been done. So let's talk about those just real briefly. So, the degradation or absence of ice has been correlated with HSP90, which is a heat shock protein. So basically, um, when fish are stressed, they generate a protein in response to that fresh, uh, stress, and uh, that can be detected, and you can see increases in it, and that lets you know that the fish have been stressed. Well, this is happening during development. It's a stress response during development, and that heat shock protein 
the, the abundance of it has been correlated with what happens with their eyes. Um, and both adult fish and the embryos exhibit a stress response to the lower conductivity of the cave water. So what's amazing about that statement is it's not just the adult fish. So remember the cave fish, the adult is experiencing the higher light and then basically it passed, it basically made a modification and passed it on to their offspring. This is happening to the embryos. Hopefully that, I didn't know my laser was that powerful. Um, this is happening to the embryos, right? It's not even the juvenile fish, this is happening in the embryo. They're sensing the conductivity of the water as an embryo and adjusting the development of eyes based on that stress. Isn't that amazing? That's, not, that's the embryo doing this. So what's interesting too is that the sighted fish experience the same stress response, which would tend to indicate that perhaps that's exactly why the fish that are in the caves don't have eyes is because it started with the sighted fish that migrated in, they had the stress response and therefore as an adaptive response to the conditions, stopped generating eyes. The embryos did. So in fact, it's been reported that blind cave fish can actually produce sighted offspring as little as one generation. So when you reverse the conditions, they can regenerate the eyes. Um, so that leads, begs the question, is blindness a reversible response to environmental conditions just like skin pigmentation? And the answer to that is, not sure yet. Research is ongoing, but let me give you a hint. There's some pretty strong evidence that that's exactly what we're going to find because it's not just the fish that do this. There are also blind cave centipedes and blind cave salamanders and a number of others, just to make, ex make those as a couple of examples. And here's what they all share in common. They lose skin pigmentation, they lose eyes, and they lose their circadian rhythmicity. So they basically lose the cycle of day and night in, in terms of activity. And, but they also get something else. They get enhancement of wakefulness, taste, smell, and mechanical sensation. They can sense vibrations and things better. So, so it's not just that they all exhibit the same sort of response. They're losing their eyes, they're losing their skin, and it's happening across a number of different organisms, but they also get the same sort of enhancements. So this implies that we've got similar conditions detected and similar internal programming we're getting a similar response. This is engineering, right? This is engineered optimization, just like I was saying. Um, the, the odds of a whole bunch of different organisms having exactly the same response to exactly the same conditions are pretty slim. This is, this is engineering, this is not chance. So the conclusions from the ICR experiments are as follows. <clears throat> None of this is a surprise when we apply the TTM framework because it's expected that the organism itself is the source of the adaptive variation. It's also expected that the mechanism is trait chain. We just talked about how that might happen. And it's also expected that they solve this trait chain function by modifying their DNA. So someone might object and say, well, you know, these ICR experiments are done with a small number of fish in only a couple generations. Um, so, you know, can we really draw any conclusions. Well, I'll say the, the conclusions are preliminary. That's true. But are there other experiments done that have larger populations of organisms and which we can apply the same flame, framework and has explanatory power so that we're more convinced this is exactly what's going on? And of course, I wouldn't ask the question if the answer wasn't yes. <laughs> so, uh, Experiments have been done on Drosophila melangas melanogaster. Does anyone know what that is? Fruit flies, that's right, exactly right, fruit flies. So fruit flies are great for experiments because they don't live very long, they reproduce quickly, uh, and they're small, right? So you can do experiments on large populations in a small area, and you can see what happens very quickly over successive generations. So a lot of, a lot of experiments have been done on fruit flies. Um, the ones in particular that I'm gonna talk about uh, were done at the University of Pennsylvania. So there was, there was a, an earlier study at the University of Pennsylvania that observed that over the span of a growing season, uh, so basically summer to late fall, that the traits that the fruit fly had were very different. The initial population, the fruit flies had very different traits early on in summer than they did in late fall. Uh, so it's interesting, so they seem to be changing over a span of a season. And those observed changes had to do with stress tolerance, reproductive fitness, and pigmentation, again. Um, and so they did a new study 
to look for changes during the season to see what, why is it that they're ending up you know, looking very different, what's happening during the season. <clears throat> so they did a study over four months, which is 10 generations of fruit flies. So again, they reproduce pretty quickly. Um, and <clears throat> they used 10 separate populations. They took an original population, established 10 separate populations from it. They started um, with that population and exposed all of them to similar conditions. Um, and they started with 1,000 founders in each population, and each population grew to approximately 100,000. So we're talking a million fruit flies here. That's a pretty big population. You, you ought to be able to get uh, pretty granular on changes because you've got a large sample size now, right? The bigger sample size you have in science, the more, the more firm your conclusions can be. <clears throat> okay, so what happened? Well, this is the experimental setup. So you, they, had, uh, they had basically orchards, and they had, these are 10 different enclosures that they had to separate those fruit fry populations. Again, they started with one population, 1,000 founders in each of the pens. They kept them separated, but as you can see, uh, you know, their, their mesh and such, you can, you know, the, the temperature and air currents and all that stuff is similar. It's not exactly the same, which by the way is an important point, you'll see in a second. It's not exactly the same, but they're similar. They're in similar areas, you, you know, there's a bunch of them here. They go down here and around, around the corner there. And so, what did they find? Well, here's what they did. They conducted an analysis every four weeks, which is equivalent to one to four generations, so basically once a month. Uh, they connected analysis. And what they did is they removed um, individual flies and about 2,500 eggs, and then they raised them separately to maturity. You kind of get a snapshot of what's going on as opposed to allowing them to continue to interact during the experiment, right? So they basically took a, a snapshot or a slice in time, four times, to see if they could, could find what was happening, how, they, how quickly they were changing, things like that, what, what was going on. So they sampled them for six different physical characteristics. Um, and these characteristics, are known to be polygenic, which means these characteristics, these traits are controlled by more than one gene. So this involves uh, a fairly decent uh, portion of the genome. So it's not, so it's, they're looking for larger effects, um, again, that we can be more certain about. Um, they also randomly selected 100 flies from each population to analyze them genetically. And why is this important? Well, because um, if, hypothetically, you were to find that these randomly selected flies all had the same traits, then you could be pretty confident that those traits are getting fixed, so to speak, in the population. In other words, you're not sampling outliers, you're sampling a general, uh, general idea of the population. So you're not sampling outliers in the population, you can be pretty sure the whole population is headed that direction because you're sampling randomly from the population. And if they all have the same trait, you're pretty sure the whole population is moving that way. And so, Here's what they found. The direction of adaptation, and I've got quote marks around this because I borrowed straight from their paper because, frankly, they were astonished. Here's what they found. That the direction of adaptation that was occurring changed multiple times. It swung like a pendulum back and forth. First they go, went one way, then they went the other, as those environmental conditions changed. And the adaptation was rapid and continuous. They term it adaptive tracking. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Uh, as some of you know, the ICR is starting to refer to this as continuous environmental tracking. And of course, in the TTM framework, what's the first step? Tracking. This is adaptive tracking. So they're saying, they're saying the same thing. And they also said the changes were not in response to a single selective event, like you would expect, expect from natural selection. So what, uh, what does the data actually look like? So here's one of the graphs. I'm going to go through several of these graphs. So this one is for fecundity, which is the eggs laid per day. Fecundity just being a measure of how, how much reproductive success the population is going to have, how many eggs they're producing. So what's, it's a little hard to see in here, but here's the, here's the line of the trend, in this case, between July 25th and October 10th. And that's the line of the trend for all 10 populations. These gray lines are each population individually. You see this? This one is going this direction, up more eggs per day, and then, then between August and September went the other direction. And then went back up again. So did this one. So did that one. This one went up and then back down. They all converge on a trend line this direction, but they're changing back and forth. And remember I said that they're in similar conditions, but not exactly the same? I would submit that the reason why this population does this and that population does that is because they're tracking very closely with their conditions. They're only, you know, 20 feet away, but they're fruit flies, so they're, 
they are susceptible to small changes, right? But they're tracking these changes very closely. <clears throat> Here's another one. This is the size of the eggs. And this one, there was a lot more variability in the populations. You can see there's, there's up and down, up and down. But over time, it tended to trend um, a single direction. Here's a real interesting one. This is developmental rates, how fast they, they develop. And this one, not only did the population swing back and forth, but so did the trend. The development rate went down at first, and then it started going back up. Here's another one. And this is starvation. So how long does it take to starve to death in hours, which is kind of a brutal experiment. But um, anyway, so this one, again, had a trend. You see, again, you've got variation in the way this is swinging, but it tended to uh, trend downward. Here's another one, chill coma recovery. So if you get really cold and you basically go in a coma, how fast does it take to recover? Um, which is, you know, important if you're a fruit fly because if it gets you cold, are you going to die or are you going to be able to recover from it continue? So that's a good way to measure fitness for your environment. And this one stayed fairly level, but it did trend um, in a particular direction over time. But again, you see that there was, there was some swinging back and forth among some of these populations. And here's probably the most dramatic one. Um, this is desiccation tolerance, uh, so how fast you dry out, basically. Um, and here's the founder. When they put the founders in, they were at this level, and immediately the populations took a dive, and then they went back up, and then they flattened out, and then they went back down again. So they were reversing direction over these months. So pretty dramatic, actually. Um, and here's the way they, they, their reaction to it. It says, to think that a trait could evolve over a certain number of weeks and then reverse direction the following month, that was very surprising. And this change was both phenotypic, so variation in gene expression, and genomic. Changes actually to the DNA, to the genes, happened. In fact, more than 60% of the genome changed in these changes. So this is, a, this is not just the way that they're expressing, the way they, they look physically in their traits, but their actual DNA is changing as well. Most of it, over 60% of the genome. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the changes are directly related to this adaptation because there are changes that happen that kind of piggyback along side regions that change, but still, that's significant. Over 60% of the genome showed changes, and they were adaptive mutations Again, mutation meaning change or modification. So they, of course, subscribe these changes to, quote, natural selection driving evolution in multiple fitness-associated phenotypes in much of the genome, even over short time scales. They are, unfortunately, though, stuck in an old paradigm. Um, natural selection cannot do that. Why do I say that? It's too slow. They can't track this fast. Why do I say that? Well, let's take it from Darwin himself. Here's what he said. He says, as natural selection acts solely by accumulating slight successive favorable variations, it can produce no great or sudden modifications. It can act only by short and slow steps. And I spent a considerable amount of time in my 2016 presentation explaining exactly why that is true. But also, in that same presentation, we discovered that differential survival is not efficient and it's not effective as a filter. And something's got to be very efficient and effective to change over 60% of the genome in four months and to track back and forth, back and forth so closely. Not only that, but we also discovered in the 2021 presentation that selection is significantly impacted by genetic drift. It slows it down because genetic drift throws a wrench in the works because it's random. It could be adaptive. It could be maladaptive. It's random. So... What are the implications of this? Well, they reasoned that previous studies missed the astonishingly rapid rate of the change and the multiple fluctuations in the direction because they were looking at two more distant points in time. They just didn't have a, a small enough time scale. And so they concluded that it could be a general phenomena. And they said the burden is now on us to determine the time scale in which it is occurring. In response, I say, the ability to closely track these changes was missed because of two wrong assumptions. Number one, a wrong assumption about the rate. It's very rapid. And number two, a wrong assumption about the mechanism. It's not natural selection that's doing this. So I asked the question, what would be observed if these flies were sampled every generation? 
what we expect. They sampled it every one to four generations. What if they sampled them every generation? So it, they sampled the flies each generation. The parent, the offspring, their offspring, they sampled every time. What would we find? Well, I'm pretty sure I can predict that because remember, trait chain is an iterative process and it occurs in individual organisms. So we would expect to find those individual organisms are changing these traits on the fly. Not to, that is kind of a pun, isn't it? Train, training them on the fly. Um, you may have heard that individuals don't adapt, populations adapt. That's kind of a mantra. Um, but that's wrong. That's simply wrong. And what's happening is a population is adapting because the individuals within that population are adapting on the fly. So an analogy is helpful here, and I'm going to use one from the 2021 presentation to help us understand what I mean by this. So here's the analogy. The analogy is distributed computing. So distributed computing uses multiple network computers and it's used to solve complex problems. So you have to use a lot of computing power to solve a complex problem. One computer is not enough. So you have multiple computers, you distribute the same algorithm to each computer and they run the, they run the problem separately, okay? And that's called a distributed algorithm. And that kind of algorithm is really good at solving problems for which a consensus must be rapidly reached regarding which solution is the best solution. So these computers all do it separately, then they compare their answer, and they go with the best answer, and then they do it again, et cetera, and so they rapidly converge on a solution that is appropriate. And it's established by communicating between these nodes with these computers. Like I said, they generate the solution, they compare notes, so to speak, then they do it again, et cetera, and, and as a result, they very quickly arrive at the optimal solution. So tray chain is a distributed problem-solving algorithm and it rapidly establishes a population-wide consensus regarding the adaptive traits that are appropriate for their environmental niche. And that's established by reproduction, right? So there is a role for reproduction. Um, it's not the role of differential survival, differential production, or natural selection. It's the role of essentially comparing notes. So what happens is each organism generates a unique solution set to the specific environmental problem it finds itself in, and of course, we saw that, remember the graphs with the individual populations, they're like 20 feet from each other, generating a different direction solution to the same problem in time, but they eventually all converge on the same solution, right? Um, so the most common solution sets are reproduced in greater number. You've got you know, more individuals that come up with a similar solution, that solution wins out in reproduction, so it's reproduced more, and so the population shifts in that direction. So each generation then is another iteration towards the optimal solution. And as a result, the entire population rapidly converges on the optimal solution set. That is not natural selection, that is engineered optimization, which is the purpose of adaptation. The purpose of adaptation is not survival, it's optimization. So what can we conclude from these fruit fly experiments? Well, again, none of this is a surprise when we apply the TTM framework, right? Because it's expected that the organism itself is a source of adaptive variation. It's also expected that the mechanism of adaptation is trait chain and that the organisms are solving this trait chain function by modifying their DNA. And finally, as we just saw, the populations are rapidly converging on a solution by distributed problem solving, which makes perfect sense in this framework. So how did the authors of this study conclude? Here's what they said. They said, our data from this approach <clears throat> support a model of adaptive tracking in which populations adapt in continuous response or in response to continuous environmental change. Again, does this sound awfully familiar? <laughs> um, this is what, th this is what, uh, ICR and I have been saying for uh, 10 years now, uh, they have a model called continuous environmental tracking, right? But it gets better. Determining whether adaptive tracking is a general feature of natural populations and elucidating the mechanisms by which it occurs could be transformative for understanding the generation and maintenance of biodiversity. No kidding. <laughs> it's a total paradigm shift and they're recognizing it. So here are my final thoughts about adaptation. First of all, and this is important, natural selection is an illusion. That is not what's going on here. Specifically, death is not the mechanism that sustains life. Adaptation is designed, it's purposeful, 
It's engineered optimization. It's purposeful, precise, efficient, and highly complex. And the proximate source is the organism itself. But the ultimate source is the responsible engineer. This is engineered. The bottom line is that the ability of organisms to adapt is brilliantly designed, and it clearly points to a master designer. And that is all I have for today, so I'm going to take a time for questions. But I, like I promised before, uh, I am putting up this slide so that you can, if you want, take a picture with your cell phone or write it down. Um, the links to my other two presentations on the topic in October 16 and May of 21, there's a link there in green. And also the paper I wrote with Dr. Galuza, um, and presented, he presented at uh, ICC in 2018, there's a link for that. I will leave that up for a second, and then after the first couple of questions, I will then switch to another slide, which gives you links to the two studies that I just talked about. So with that, I'll take Th some questions. Thank you very much, Phil. And Phil has referred several times. <laughs> he has referred several times to his 2016 presentation, 2021. Yep. Those are on our YouTube channel, and there are links to both of those in our newsletter. And if you are not receiving our newsletter by email, see me afterwards, please. And this month's newsletter is on our website under resources newsletter. And you can go to that for this month and bring up those links to Phil's previous two talks. And for questions, please.